Hello, Sublation Media viewers and future readers. It's me again, Douglas Lane, and in this video, I'll be returning to summarizing the 1967 book, Society of the Spectacle. This time, I'll compare the criticism in DeBoard's book with a segment from the 2016 film, Hypernormalization, about Patti Smith, in an effort to use a more current critique to elucidate the mid-20th century concept of the spectacle. At the beginning of hypernormalization, Adam Curtis states the thesis of his film this way. We live in a strange time. Extraordinary events keep happening that undermine the stability of our world. Suicide bombs, waves of refugees, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, even Brexit. Yet those in control seem unable to deal with them, and no one has any vision of a different or better kind of future. This film will tell the story of how we got to this strange place. It is about how, over the last 40 years, politicians, financiers, and technological utopians, rather than face up to the real complexities of the world, retreated. Instead, they constructed a simpler version of the world in order to hang on to power. And as this fake world grew, all of us went along with it, because the simplicity was reassuring. The periodization that Curtis deploys here is, I think, misleading. It's misleading because the fake world, the simpler world that we all find so reassuring, didn't arise in 1975. It didn't emerge at the moment when Fordist America began to shift over into the neoliberal order, an order that we can all now see only because it too is fading away. But instead, it was firmly established by the end of the Second World War and was on the scene well before then. By 1962, the problem of pseudo-reality was the subject of the conservative historian and social critic Daniel Borston's book, The Image, A Guide to Pseudo-Events in America. Borston, a former member of the Communist Party who turned to the right, wrote of how the PR industry and news agencies were creating confusion in the American public by orchestrating pseudo-events, or spectacles, that helped the political class maintain power. That is, the problem of pseudo-reality, ideology, or as Guy Debord would put it, the spectacle, became known before finance capital dominated our politics, before Gerald Ford fell down the steps as he deplaned from Air Force One, and before Ronald Reagan and Max Headroom smiled at us from our television screens and promised us a new beginning. Catch the wave, Coke. Russia. While neoliberalism and the attendant retreat from politics that Curtis describes in his film was an ideological response to the precarity brought on by the economic crisis of the 70s, the spectacle itself arose in response to the abundance of the post-war boom. The spectacle, De Boer wrote in 1967, is rooted in the economy of abundance. In Hypernormalization, Curtis describes the singer-songwriter Patti Smith as a representative of the new kind of radical individualist that arose in the mid-70s. After the failure of the New Left in the 60s, she, like the rest of the Left and like the politicians, retreated. While the politicians turned over their responsibility and power to the private banks, the New Left radicals gave up collective power in exchange for personal empowerment and expression. What this retreat relied upon, however, was the way one's personality had already been set up as a commodity, as something to be consumed during the era of the New Left. The invention of the celebrity, not as a popular figure representing a given set of qualities and abilities, but as an empty shell representing an always changing set of priorities and values, 
as a fake and a phony, perhaps as a grifter, had already occurred. In 1962, Daniel Borston wrote that the celebrity was a person who is well known for her well-knownness. In 1967, DeBoer wrote that the stars of consumption, though outwardly representing different personality types, show each of these types enjoying equal access to and deriving equal happiness from the entire realm of consumption. The admirable people who personify the system are well known for not being what they seem. They attain greatness by stooping below the reality of the most insignificant individual life. And everyone knows it. Earlier, during the Enlightenment, public intellectuals such as Voltaire and Rousseau were early celebrities famous for their lives as well as their ideas. And sure, their lives included titillating episodes of infidelity, illegitimate offspring, and time spent in prison or on the run. But they lived during a time of political change, and their individuality and private desires had public significance. Challenging the authority of the church, of kings, or tradition was not a mere personal gesture in the 17th century. Whereas when Patti Smith declared, Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine, at the beginning of her cover of the song, Gloria, by them, she wasn't just challenging the authority of the church, she wasn't challenging the authority of the Pope, but she was rejecting all authority, even the new authority of the people as expressed through the Fortis state. In her poem, Oath, a poem she self-plagiarized for her cover of Gloria, she wrote, quote, So Christ, I'm firing you tonight. I can make my own light shine, and darkness too is equally fine. You got strung up for my brother. You died for someone's sins, but not mine. In his book, Society the Spectacle, De Boer wrote that complacent acceptance of the status quo may also coexist with purely spectacular rebelliousness. Dissatisfaction itself becomes a commodity as soon as the economy of abundance develops the capacity to process that particular raw material. In Hypernormalization, Adam Curtis said that around 1975, Hattie Smith and many others became a new kind of individual radical who watched the decaying city with a cool detachment. They didn't try and change it. They just experienced it. Look at that. Isn't that cool? I love that where like kids write all over the walls. After the segment on Patti Smith, Curtis cuts to a clip from an art film created by the conceptual artist Martha Rosler in 1975 a film entitled The Semiotics of the Kitchen. In Curtis's film, he punctuates his condemnation of this new apolitical form of radicalism with the finale of Rossler's film. He cuts to the moment when Rossler slashes the air with a kitchen knife to make the letter Z. In her explanation of the work, Rossler states that the securely understood signs of domestic industry and food production erupt into anger and violence in her film. But we should recognize that this gesture was made at the very moment when the security of a middle-class existence for working people could no longer be taken for granted. It was a moment of retreat away from a political struggle to change society into a politics of expression and the kind of resistance that gave the emerging neoliberal order some traction. In 1975, the intellectuals and artists of the spectacle could no longer do more than bear witness to the passing of a way of life that was already in the rearview mirror. However, this passivity wasn't recognized for what it was, a defensive reaction to defeat, but rather it was transformed into a posture of rebellion, a rebellion not only against inequities and exploitation, but also a rebellion against the idea of change and against the power to create change. 
If we are to take de Borde seriously, to grant him that under the conditions of late capitalism, the world of real relations and engagement with history has been supplanted by the spectacle, then what we should recognize is that the pseudo-rebellion of the 70s demonstrated that even our collective misery and impoverishment could be turned into something to consume and by extension, into someone to be. Today, as neoliberalism fades, perhaps to be replaced by a neo-Fordism or by new forms of nationalism, we may very well see a return to the politics of power that Curtis regrets having lost. But do we want that power to return if it is merely a new iteration of the spectacle? What is fashion? It is glamour. While Patti Smith and Martha Rossler turned away from the transcendent and declared that they stood outside of the mediating structures of society, the structures that dictated the operations of our world, while they insisted that they were free, at least on the inside, those structures kept operating, kept pushing us all forward. The spectacle kept perfecting itself and will keep perfecting itself for as long as we refuse to intervene rather than merely observe what is happening. Until then, we can enjoy the apocalypse as it scrolls across our screens in the form of TikTok videos. Well, good luck. Oh, wait, you think Russia's just going to stop after they defeat us? Yes. They want to take over the world. Okay, but if we try and stop them, we start World War III. But if you don't stop them, they're stopping World War III. Ukraine, by the power of deductive reasoning, it sounds like you think World War III is unavoidable? Does your Tiger Woods play golf? Yes, it's unavoidable. I've been saying that. This is so bad. I call USA. USA, 50% off. I want to remind you that GCAS is Sublation Media's one and only sponsor. They are an educational institution offering accredited degrees, and they are running seminars in critical theory, psychoanalysis, communication, philosophy, and literature. Upcoming seminars include Rocky Gangle on Spinoza's Ethics, Keith Faulkner's seminar on the Genealogy of Ideas, including lectures on Nietzsche, Foucault, and Deleuze, Emma Lee Russen on George Bataille's Religion Without Religion, and many others. If you're interested in a radical education, follow the link to GCAS in the description. Supporting GCAS is a good way to support Sublation Media.